stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your grace. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Praise to you, O oh Christ, Lamb of our salvation. We will be reading Psalm 22 responsively. It is found in the front of your hymnal. Congregation will be speaking the even verses. And we leave off the Gloria tonight. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our God is trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. All the prosperous of the earth eat in worship. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, even the ones who could not keep himself alive. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that it is finished. You may be seated.
passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. First, a reading from Mark. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will.
Jesus came and found the disciples sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Now, from John's version of the Passion. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, 
he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once a rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's palace. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's palace so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber.
Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters and again said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified.
Congregation, please stand. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You may be seated.
since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Amen. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. That's why we've come tonight, isn't it? To behold Christ once again. To behold him in the words of Scripture, in the Passion reading. To look at our images, especially the crucifix, the crosses. Who are we to behold? Who is this man? that Pilate hauls out before the Jews. He was born and raised in poverty, a working home of a despised ethnic group. He wrote no book. He composed no music. He established no laws or system of government. He made no scientific discoveries or great inventions. And he founded no earthly empire. 
He had no army, no navy, no air force, no soldiers, no sword. And even one of his disciples, when they had a sword, he said, put it away. He was rejected by his own people. He is continually rejected even today. He was condemned by the church of his day, and he was put to death and crucified by the state. And yet, the power and the influence of Jesus Christ extends far above and beyond the influence of scholars and preachers, philosophers and politicians, generals and scientists, artists and emperors, all the great men and women that this world have ever seen or ever will see. Jesus is matchless. Jesus, behold him. You know, any letters or legal documents signed today were dated 2022 A.D. Not after death, though I understand if you thought it was that. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Or to put the long form on it, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. The ancient Greeks tried to date their time from their Olympic Games. It failed. The Romans tried to date their time from the founding of their great city. That failed. In France, they tried to date time from the beginning of the French Revolution. The Muslims tried to date time from the time that Muhammad fled from Mecca. That failed. But what the Greeks, the Romans, the French, the Muslims, and many others failed to do, Jesus of Nazareth accomplished. 2022 A.D., the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, whose life extended only a short time on this earth, his public ministry only three years, inscribed his name into our calendars, into our music, into our art, into our literature, into our culture. Jesus is matchless. Jesus, behold him. Behold him tonight first as the eternal God who was revealed in human flesh. Jesus, who shared eternal glory with the Father before the world was made and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. It happened in Bethlehem when the Virgin Mary gave birth to the eternal Son of God. An event so important that even if the meaning is lost sometimes in our Christmas celebrations, almost everyone on earth to some extent, celebrates his birthday, Christmas. When his enemies cast slurs at him, he calmly declared, Before Abraham was, I am. That is God's name in the Old Testament. He was saying he is God. The great creator born of one of his creatures. The great and eternal God sleeping in a cattle trough. Son of God and son of man. So much the son of God as though he were not the Son of Man. So much the Son of Man as though he were not the Son of God. Human and divine he was and is. So human that he got tired and he slept. So divine that when he arose from sleep, he calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. So human that he got hungry and he had to eat. So divine that he took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 hungry mouths. So human that it took him a boat to cross a lake. So divine that he walked over the waves of that lake on the way back. So human that he attended a wedding. So divine that he changed water to wine. So human that he wept even as you or I do at the grave of a friend. So divine that he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead and returned him to the empty arms and aching hearts of his sisters. So human that he could fall weary and exhausted under the burden of the heavy cross. So human that he could die. So human that he could be placed into a grave in a burial like we all will be. So divine that no grave could hold him but three days. Jesus is matchless. Jesus, behold him. But there's something else. Behold Christ crucified. Is this why you are here tonight? He was made a curse for us, think of it. Jesus, the image of the infinite and holy God, 
a curse for us. He was to be a blessing. Jesus, whom the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, was made a curse for us, for you, for me. There is one verse in Scripture which takes a long time for self-righteous and proud mortals to admit and believe, even here, even tonight. It says this, God has made him, that's Jesus, to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He who had no sin became sin for us. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus became everything that God must judge and must condemn. It's amazing to me when we sing, you know, O sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down. He had nothing to be ashamed of. We've all felt shame and it burns inside of us. And we all do different things to hide or to get rid of it. He had no reason for shame. And yet he felt that shame there because he was under the condemnation of God. It was your shame that was put upon him. And he bore it. I can't bear my shame. I hate it. But he bore it. For me, for you. O blessed truth, O matchless Jesus. When we behold Christ on the cross, we behold the penalty for our sins. We behold the penalty of the sins of all mankind. But let us turn from the cross and behold Jesus risen from the dead. For that informs this day too. That's why we call it Good Friday. It was for the disciples a Black Friday. Their master was dead to his disciples. That meant the only crown he would wear would be one of thorns. His only kingdom, the grave. His only throne, a cross of wood. His only palace, a dark cave, a grave. Jesus said it is finished and the disciples all went home saying, Yes, it is the end. And life for them that day was turned into a dismal desert where no flower would bloom and there was only blackest night. And they all said, He is dead. But Jesus who turns water to wine turns a dark Friday to a good Friday. And on the third day, as he said, on Easter morning, he rose from the dead. And that truth still echoes through the ages that he lives. He lives. He lives who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. It was not a dead Christ who lit the wonderful tongues of flames on Pentecost. It was not a dead Christ who sent the early Christians and gave them power to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. And they did. It was not a dead Christ who spoke to Paul on the Damascus road and converted the persecutor of our brothers and sisters into one of them, one of us. It was not a dead Christ who Stephen beheld as he begged forgiveness for his murderers as our Lord begged forgiveness for his murderers on the cross. It was not a dead Christ that we have come to behold. But it is a Christ who died and yet now lives. He lives triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. And while today's health may be tomorrow's sickness, and while today's wealth may be tomorrow's poverty, and while today's friend or spouse may be tomorrow's memory, Yet today's Christ is tomorrow's Christ, for he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Today is no funeral for Jesus, no memorial service. It is a solemn day. It is a sober day. It is a grown-up day, an adult day of joy. It is the day that he paid for your sin. We do not merely bewail the sufferings of Christ, but rather solemnly rejoice that by his wounds, we have been healed. That the tomb, though it must come, comes because of love. And his love for you is stronger than the grave, so that when your tomb comes, it too cannot hold you. Jesus is matchless. Behold him once again as your savior, your champion, your victor, your Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
Let us stand for prayer. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men and to suffer death on the cross. Through the same Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Now when evening had come, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and he laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. 